Hello and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show episode number 584 with I, your host Agostino Zynga. This is Agostino Zynga show episode number 584 with I, your host Agostino Zynga and I hope you are doing well wherever this pod may find you, wherever it's finding you, I hope you are doing well. For those of you watching the video portion of the show, I am greatly, um, what's that thing called, apologetic for my bare arms being shown in the stream and stuff. I know sometimes it can be a little bit forward and it can constitute as essay. So I do apologize that I have my bare skin out in front of you, but please do understand that it is incredibly humid and warm and hot here in the UK, something that we are not used to at all as, um, you know, diehard Brits. And I'm struggling, struggling to keep myself alive, struggling to keep myself awake. And the only way to do so is to allow my arms to perspirate. So please do forgive me for showing to my skin please do forgive me for being a little bit too forward with the way that i'm presenting myself on camera and i hope you can forgive me for those of you listen to the podcast via the audio version you will have no idea who i'm talking about and you'll be enjoying the sultry sounds of my um breathless and hotless breathless and faintly hot um, um sounds of my voice coming through this microphone so i hope you are enjoying that also it has been an interesting week end for me, obviously, because I'm still on the mend. Um, I think I, I think, I think, and I hope I sound better than I did yesterday. Um, that is only the hope that I have at the moment. So that's going pretty well. So medication, all that sort of stuff and resting and drinking other liquids and all that good stuff is really serving me well. And this helps as well that this week has been quiet in terms of work stuff. So I haven't been able or I haven't needed to kind of push myself to the right of the edge in order to get myself back to where I need to get to. So I'm absolutely happy happy and glad about that one i'm looking forward what else i'm going to talk about looking forward looking forward looking forward looking forward oh yeah so yeah the other thing to talk about i want to get into just to jump straight into it so obviously um this weekend's been dominated mostly because of the drake album right and the reaction around it and i've seen a lot of people online basically trashing the album saying how crap it is and it feels like to me going above and beyond to have the most hottest and controversial take regarding the album itself. But for the most part, from what I can gather online, most people don't really like it. They think it's boring. They think it's uninspired. They wanted Drake to rap and they just think it fell flat. And some people are basically labeling it as H&M music, right? Which is uh, this new kind of insult that people have basically been um, regurgitating for the entirety of the weekend, which is fine. No problem with that whatsoever. Like I said previously, I don't ever if ever, maybe rarely, I can't remember the last time actually, where I listen to music off the basis of what other people say. Um, I check stuff out all the time myself every week because, you know, being a DJ and being somebody who's kind of obsessed with music, I'm always checking out new albums anyway. So I listen to everything and give everything a go from Taylor Swift to BTS to Falls to flipping Drake to whatever. I'll listen to anything and if it kind of ticks or tickles my fancy, and then of course add it to my um, listening repertoire for the week, especially when I'm running or going to the gym and stuff. So it's not that big of a deal. But I know with some people, if you're a fan of someone's work and you're a fan of what they've done previously, I think most fans nowadays, they don't really know what they want, but I would imagine if you do know what you want, you kind of just want the same, the more of the same. So if you jumped on board on the Drake kind of hype train on views, you want more of that. If you jumped during more life, you want more of that. If you jumped on during Scorpion, you want more of that. Nothing was the same, you want more of that. Whatever, it, whatever album you jumped on board, you'd probably want more of that. But as an artist, you can't, it's, do that really you can't you, you can't really be in it for fan service you can't just be making stuff um specifically to what your fans want you can't cater all your artistic output to what your fans want basically there has to be some level of input and understanding what they kind of are into but you kind of have to present i feel like new ideas new sounds um set new moods set new vibes in order to keep challenging yourself to make interesting work and obviously to evolve as an artist overall i think personally for me and from the artists i kind of grew up loving and kind of idolizing and i think another good one who i kind of went back into the archive and started to re-listen to some of his albums was david bowie is another good example somebody who consistently um reinvented himself throughout the years you know to not you know it wasn't all fanfare a lot of fans would kind of be bemoan his um descent into disco and all that kind of stuff but for the most part he did a really good job in terms of consistently reinventing himself but reinventing himself within 
within i won't say parameters but it felt like it made sense especially when you look back at it it makes sense but maybe at the time it didn't at the time but a modern day version of it would be kanye west in it right who kind of consistently throws curveballs at himself right or consistently kind of ties one arm behind his back to make it harder whether it's gospel or whether it's not no, no profanity um whether it's kind of pursuing a particular sound or trying to get a particular vibe going whatever it may be and for the most part i think if you're a fan of his work you are much better for it because he consistently keeps giving you fresh and new stuff to listen to. So I love that. All good. I think the problem Drake has at the moment, it feels like is because he still hasn't have got that classic album. Like I've always said, I sort of think he has that solid body of work that I think represents who he is as an artist in terms of giving you a bit of the rapping, giving you a bit of the R and B, maybe giving you a bit of the pop stuff, maybe giving you a bit of the Caribbean stuff. Do you know what I mean he doesn't have a solid thing that could really okay, here's a good album that kind of personifies what I'm about. I think you could take several tracks from different albums and put them together and make a compilation that would represent Drake properly and probably be a classic, but in terms of a full body cat doesn't have it at the moment. So because of that, his fans mostly want him to do what they think he does best which is rapping and r&b and then when he comes out with the house album i can understand why they get pissed off but the other side of me also thinks if you're a fan of drake and you generally don't like it you should just say you don't like it this whole like bending over backwards to try to convince yourself that it's actually good if you don't like it because especially again I, I put my flag in the ground i said i do like the album but again i'm quite biased and my taste level is maybe a little bit skewed to liking it because i'm already into house music anyway i go out a bunch i go to these clubs i hear this type of music played in places i'm going to a really big party hopefully no so festival sorry one day festival next weekend or no in a few weeks sorry and um, that's going to be catered specifically to this type of music so i'm the target demographic for it so my review is a little bit skewed in that way but i think if you're an absolute cardinal drake fan right um from nothing was the same type of person um to come back season that type of drake fan you shouldn't like this because it sounds nothing like the drake that you fell in love with but you also shouldn't make excuses similar to what dj academics is making on his profile because again he's like the number one drake fanboy and i think this type of fanboyism is something that i've never been a fan of as much as i love and sort of like worship people like pharrell and kanye and you know what they've been able to do with music over the years i also haven't it also hasn't blinkered me or blinded me to sometimes them making crappy stuff and i can call it out because i like music it's not like i'm in love with them first as people i'm in love with the music they produce and then obviously them as people later but i think when you're a over over fan boy you end up doing stuff like this and this is a tweet taken from academics instagram account this is as follows of course he's one of those people that does that thing where he you know takes a screenshot of his tweet and uploads it onto instagram which i absolutely hate but anyway we continue and this is a tweet by the way let's be real honestly never mind it's a drake mixtape he's only calling it an album because of the new deal he got where it counts as one it's in the realm of dark lane demos um if you're reading this is too late more life etc experimental and literally no rollout album still fire though so you're making up all these excuses to justify why you think the album is fire or to give credence or reason as to why the album came out the way it came out which is a nonsense drake specifically said in his caption when it was coming out that it was his seventh studio album it was meant to be the big release after he got off his last deal which he spoke about cryptically in a few raps prior to that um there was a big you know rumor mill going on will he stay independent will he sign this crazy bag deal with apple blah blah blah, blah. then you end up re-upping with whatever he was with before with some you know i'm sure it's an exclusive crazy money deal which we won't really be privy to but this was meant to be one of the big releases that was going to come out post you know certified love boy especially considering how lukewarm the reception to certified lover boy was this was meant to be the big one okay cool let me redeem myself so the fact that hip-hop fans don't like this is a big deal but if you're again if you're drake nut hugger you're gonna make all these backwards flipping thing you know things to make to justify why maybe the album is not as good as maybe you'd hoped it to be then his other tweet as well as equal is disgusting it says as follows i ain't gonna lie drake album is definitely jersey club inspired i don't know what jersey club academics has been to he doesn't look at someone that goes that goes to nightclubs personally for me but you know who knows shout out to all my jersey club producers which 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 one of y'all were on this album so many elements here that reminded me of what y'all have built over the last 15 plus years. Jersey Club is the backbone of Bronx Drill and this is Drake's album. What? I don't even know what the fuck he's talking about. Somehow Jersey Club has to do with Bronx Drill. I don't know. 
and somehow Jersey Club inspired this album that sounds nothing like Jersey Club. It sounds like all the music that they're playing right now in Ibiza, they're playing now in Barcelona, they're playing now in parts of Switzerland, they're playing in Austria, they're playing in parts of Berlin. Like this is the house music that's kind of running the scene at the moment. It's probably overtaken, I would say, even tech house, this kind of atmospheric house sort of scene thing. Um, so to label it Jersey Club is absolutely preposterous. There's nothing on there, Jersey Club. There's nothing on there. It's probably even Jersey Club Tempo, I'd imagine. Jersey Club Tempo is a way higher. It's like 126 or something, 128. This sounds like it's in the region between like 110 to 118, maybe 124. So I don't know what that means. But this is what I don't like when you're a fanboy. You start to make all these excuses. And I think in general, for me personally, if you're going to be a fanboy of somebody, you should be able to call out when stuff isn't to par that you don't like. You shouldn't be making all these backward excuses. And I, I just don't think it's, it's just not nice. It's just not cool. It's lame. That's a, that's a thing. It's just not cool. It's very lame. Um, and I don't know. I've never, I've never looked at stands and thought, yeah, I want to be a stand because they look cool. Um, I just looked at it as a lame thing. I think you can be a stand or you can be a fan of somebody without having to cop please, without having to bend over backwards, without having to, you know, rack your brain for excuses. And just say, hey, I expected to hear a, you know, a quintessential Drake album. I didn't get it. It was all dance music. I don't like dance music. I don't go out. I don't dance. So I hate it. It's all good to say that. But to make these excuses just me just doesn't make any sense. And of course, he's now posting stats as well, showing Drake controls to top 15 in US music charts, whatever it may be. But in conclusion, part of the reason why also the reception has been so lukewarm to it is because he you know i think at that level if you're if you're a star at that level of drake level that kind of level of fame you mean too much to too many people you know you mean too many different things to too many different people and i think one of the reasons why somebody like a bad bunny i think does really well is because he seems to only care about kind of presenting his music the way he wants to present it Obviously, there's a core theme in terms of reggaeton there, but he just cares about presenting the music the way he wants it to be presented. He doesn't try to satisfy anything. He just, I'm going to present it how I want to present it. You like it or you don't. I think when you try to play the whole liking, guessing game thing, this is where you end up. But I think ultimately, like I said before in my first review, I think ultimately this will be a good thing for Drake going forward. I think he's going to be in a far better place artistically because I've always felt like he didn't take enough chances on his albums. They all basically kind of blended into each other. I would have liked to have heard more of a statement of like, okay, cool, this album I'm going to try and make the perfect pop record. This album I'm going to try and make the pop, the perfect flipping interpretation of like Caribbean music that I love. Do you know what I mean? Or whatever it may be. He didn't do that enough for me personally. So I think if he can do that going forward, it's going to be fucking sick. Um, and he just like takes chances because then I'm sure from that run, he'll be able to extract from himself a classic album. I don't think he's gonna be able to extract from himself, in my opinion anyway, a classic just focusing on trying to replicate the success of parts of other albums. I don't think it's gonna work that way, in my opinion anyway. I don't think that's how it works. I think you need to be somewhat conceptual, somewhat avant-garde, somewhat out there in your approach. And that's how you end up kind of getting or finding your way or stumbling across you know, a classic in your repertoire, but again, what do I know? Moving on from that one. Oh yeah, we've got all this stuff happening and get to tie in with the whole Drake album. There's um, there's a whole bevy of events happening in the next couple of weeks or so. Obviously, um, what, what's, that, what's that place called? Playa, what's it called? Uh, po Poble Espanol in Barcelona. This little square where everyone does these amazing events, right? Um, I should get up on the screen. Um, it's absolutely incredible the site and a lot of kind of housey type events happen there um mostly let's say dance music type of events happen there and at the moment there's an event happening with innervisions there was an event happening with kind of music um two labels set up in berlin that predominantly push house music i'm actually surprised they haven't done a collaborative night actually kind of music and innervision there hasn't been a collaborative sort of like showcase between the two of them maybe because it's each other's competition i'm not really too sure but i think in terms of taste in terms of fan bases they're quite different I would imagine kind of music is a little younger in terms of the people that they attract, a little bit more hipster, whereas Innovision is probably a little bit more grown up, chin stroking type people like myself, do you know what I mean? But in general, this pop, this Poble Espanol venue is absolutely incredible. It's supposed to be meant to be a museum. They host it all in the center in this little square. 
Um, so it's, it's basically, so what do you call it? A pavilion? Is it a pavilion? Whatever you call it, right? Where you've got this massive square in the middle, all these buildings facing it, classic looking. And just imagine how incredible this must be for local tourism as well, right? They must get an influx of tourists coming in, booking up Airbnbs and hotels, eating at their restaurants and bars and shit. So, you know, in places like these, they basically, the backbone of it is, you know, tourism and all that good stuff. So without it, um, it must be bleak. So the fact that this has turned into like a yearly affair during kind of Sonar and all that stuff is absolutely incredible. And at the moment, they've got one going on with um, kind of music that looks absolutely great. I went to play a couple of clips from courtesy of um, Rampa from kind of music's uh, Instagram profile. And it looks so, so fun. Um, this is the kind of stuff that gives me FOMO. Like legit, you know, like good times, good vibes, people out, um, open air sort of events. This is the stuff that I get FOMO from for the most part, less so than the kind of nightclub-y type of things because I guess here in London, I'm kind of spoiled for that and there's so many different options and for the most part, nightclubs have been a little bit dead since the pandemic has kind of quelled or the restrictions have kind of quelled. But this looks really, really fun, this open air stuff. It's maybe a little bit funny, optics-wise, looking at it, seeing so many Caucasian-looking people dancing to this um, African-inspired house music. But, you know, you have to kind of get over that over a period of time. But it is quite magical to look at in terms of square, how this produced, the sound, the scenery. It's proper, proper Instagram-ready as well in terms of just how it's laid out and how they do the production and everything around it. I, I, one other slight snip picking I'm not really a fan of the whole like free DJs that gathering around the decks at the same time but you know they're a crew they're a collective they're a group of friends close friends brothers whatever maybe family quote unquote so I guess it's not really that much of a big deal but it does feel a little bit pretentious a little bit too try hard but hey what do I know like that's like proper like everyone wants to be main character do you know what I mean in the, in the, in the scene you know what I mean they all want to be in the frame but again, you know, I'm nitpicking a little bit, but this looks fucking fun. I'm not going to lie. Mm -hmm. Next clip. Course on the outside. Right? Look how fun that looks. And that's one of the things I think doesn't get... Oh, by the way, it was a Circo Loco um, off Sonar event. That's one of the things I don't think um, gets spoken about highly enough when it comes to festivals like Primavera and stuff that I obviously went to a couple of years in a row and missed out on this year because it looked a little bit crazy and stuff, whatever it may be. But for the most part, so why, the, why those festivals are so good and so amazing is primarily, I'm going to say primarily, let's say 70% to do with the location. Barcelona is an incredible, incredible place for festivals. I still say, oddly enough, I'm a weird guy like that. I still say I prefer Madrid over Barcelona as a city to visit. But I think in terms of having a festival type experience or to go out and party and whatnot for a weekend, a week, I think there's no other better place to go than Barcelona. Like, you know, the sun, the beaches, if you want to go to them, um, the way the beer tastes over there, um, the flipping... Um, the food is incredible, the people, um, because obviously for the most part, especially during the summer, it turns into basically a tourist city. People are ready and willing to basically welcome you to open arms. They're really ready and willing to open, to welcome your business and your commerce and stuff. They're prepared for it. They treat you accordingly well. Like it's just a great place set up is perfectly to kind, kind of welcome tourists in that regard. And I really, 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 really fucking love it. Um, and I think again, like these sort of parties and events, like all you need to do is basically figure out the location in that great country to go and put your party at. And by the, for the most part, if you get the production, if you get the sound done, you basically got yourself a guaranteed banger of an event. The 
Cravinho. Seeing them dance like this, this music is a little bit cringe, but still, it looks fun. <laughs> but yeah, big up um, kind of music, big up Ramper, big up Adam Paul, big up and me doing the damn thing and who knows maybe the Drake album is going to be the reason why people are going to be checking out this type of music again um it'll be interesting to see because like i've mentioned previously i think in terms of general public reception no in terms of general public tech house is probably the most maybe maybe only second to edm it's probably the most um successful dance music genre at the moment that regular folk listen to like normies but if if it can flip it on its head, this album and turn and kind of comp- if, if if we can get a position where house and atmospheric house and stuff is at the same level as tech house, that'd be incredible because tech house is fucking dominating. Those guys like Michael Bibby and all those type of dudes, they are selling out places like you know print works and stuff on a regular when they do their label showcases and whatnot. But if it can turn into a thing where suddenly atmospheric house becomes like the you know the second biggest flipping genre in dance music it'll be incredible to see don't get me wrong adam you know kind of music aren't some dummies you know what i mean they've already got some big corporate um sponsorships and relationships on deck already i'm sure that gta thing didn't help um helps as well in terms of their appeal and how they got out there and whatnot but yeah, let's see man you never know what the drake effect can do on these type of things it might go absolutely dummy after this going forward i think yeah this last slide was pretty sick as well this on them in the chicken shop <laughs> it was super hilarious but yeah big up everybody that went and intended i cannot wait to be going to lost in the moment which is happening what 9th of july that i'm going to right um that's happening 9th of july really 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 looking forward to that um so if you're in the uk and you are you want to have a taste of what that sound is all about then i do recommend checking out this event here which i have on screen lost in the moment united kingdom featuring armin dixon avalon emerson chloe Callet, dj holographic uh car god jansen hi jenny cara jimmy jules and tricks manola tough and nick castle playing at tough man on the 9th of july absolutely incredible lineup there's still tickets available now so make sure you jump on them if you haven't already make sure you jump on them then there's a quickly thing that i noticed or i checked out or saw online which i thought was pretty sick courtesy of a photographer called julian klenich wits i think that might be a polish name i'm pretty sure it might be polish but julian kelly switch took these amazing pictures of the one and only peggy Goo, and it got me thinking about peggy Goo, actually like what has this lady been up to i haven't really covered her on my podcast for a while um because i just don't really give a shit to be honest if i'm gonna be completely honest i don't really care too tough about her as a dj or what she produces in terms of music and i think that whole period before lockdown where it it seemed like you just couldn't turn anyone on social media without seeing her face kind of numbed me and kind of turned me off to her even though i still think she's a really really good producer i think that overexposure kind of tainted how i basically received it and i just kind of purposely blanked out of my head but i think this editorial this photo shoot that they did together for numera berlin is absolutely incredible she looks really fucking good and i love 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 the juxtaposition of her wearing what looks like chanel um in the flipping berlin underground which is you know a cesspool of absolute delinquency and deviance and um horribleness and here she is wearing garments that cost maybe more than what that station is worth which is absolutely incredible to see um the pictures are fucking fabulous i'm not going to lie she looks really fucking good man like really good pictures if there's one thing about peggy good she's going to do she's going to wear cool clothes and she's going to take good pictures you can say what you want about her DJing skills, say what you want, if she's got a ghost producer or not. But this woman knows how to take good pictures and she knows how to wear clothes really, really well. Um, so big up her for looking incredible. I'm not sure if it's a pink wig or if it's a 
her own hair but regardless it looks fucking sick like look at that i'm sure that's chanel i'm pretty sure that is chanel um walking around in some nondescript berlin um uban station somewhere you know on the way to go to a club somewhere the funny thing about it is that you'd imagine some clubs in berlin wouldn't let you in wearing this sort of outfit which is fucking hilarious because you know more often than not you would imagine you'd probably have more money than most people in that club wearing this sort of type of outfit but you can't get in because you look too prim and proper but yeah regardless she looks fucking great in it so really love the shots i'm not sure how we achieve this effect I'm not sure if this is an overexposure underexposure thing maybe it's a situation with the color on the of the film or the condition of the grain of it but it looks fucking great in it like it looks really really good so big up um big, oh yeah, it is a chanel cool so it's all chanel so this is, this is the caption here pay good for numero berlin full editorial styled in chanel in the new issue of numero berlin and obviously all the assistance and all that stuff you can check out yourself if you want to but yeah she looks absolutely incredible here man really really look good so big up her actually let's see what what has she actually been up to i haven't checked out instagram i've seen what she's done in time to be honest ever since that whole daniel anger fair, i don't really know what what her deal is or what she's doing or whatnot bloody blah 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 but this is what six hours ago a clip from Basel. Absolutely ram jammer though. Isn't it? People are happy to see her play. So big of that. What's, what's, what's that? What's that fan say? Peggy Goo brought the heat to Basel. Thank you. Nice. A little bit beg, beggy, but you know, I get it. Um, obviously recording, going around town and stuff. What's this? Another sponsor, I'm assuming. Oh, back behind the scenes with cans with Magnum and Kylie Minogue. No, I'm not gonna do that. No, thank you. Um, but yeah, looks like she's doing pretty well for herself. So big up her. She played at Melt Festival recently. It looks like as well, which which looks like a pretty sick festival in terms of what festivals that go on in Germany. The lineup looked incredible. I love um. All these fucking cranes and stuff they got in the background is a like some for some reason there's a flipping pool no a lake in the middle of the venue that people go and swim in and take pictures and shit in that looks pretty sick as well it's a pretty decent lineup of people very eclectic in terms of it and obviously they've got some big blockbuster type people like peggy playing there too so it's a pretty decent one definitely we recommend checking it or adding it to your list of places that you want to check out a melt festival it looks pretty sick let's play this clip <laughs> and also big up her for not wearing always black you know that's something so i have to give her credit for at least she's out there kind of you know um representing for people who don't want to always wear black all the time when they're playing or, or going out to events that you know you would imagine people will always wear black out <laughs> Nothing's really changed, isn't it? She's still smashing it, still booked and busy. Um, personal beers and all that good stuff. Friends all over the place wearing nice, cool, expensive clothes. You can't really go wrong, in it. You can't really go wrong. So yeah, big, big up the goo master. Big up. Oh, look at that picture there. Look at that one. I didn't. I missed this one. She looks bang in there. What an incredibly good editorial. Jesus Christ, this. They fucking smashed it. Yeah. So yeah, big up, big up, big up moving on from that one we have a closer look courtesy of hypebeast regarding the wells bonner adidas original spring 2022 footwear collection which i'm a big fan of and it's interesting to see these um updated um interpretations of the samba um what was the other shoe that was not samba what was the other one that looks like a samba i forgot the other one but you know what i mean it seems that adidas have made a concerted effort to maybe to try to bring this shoe back into the cultural zeitgeist by aligning it obviously with some key brand collaborations that are going to buy core cool points and get it in the hands and on the feet of the people that matter and shape and move culture and whatnot and then hopefully that will kind of you know um overflow out to the general public so far i haven't seen too much of it i do remember there was a period of time maybe it was around 2020 2020 to 2021 ish time 
where it felt like the original Samba, the kind of one with the white, grey and black, was tr there were, it seemed that there was a real big push to get those out to regular folks to try and wear them again and bring them back. That didn't that really, really sit or work too well, it seems like. I still see more Stan Smiths and campuses around day to day than I do Sambas, but I do like that they're at least trying to do something fresh um, and interesting with such a classic kind of model or retro of a shoe. And obviously by landing it with these cool up and coming brands such as World Bonham is a probably a good option to go with it. It's just funny, I'm thinking like, I imagine if you're white, like, could you wear these? Are these shoes only made for black people or, or can you only be an ally to wear these? Like, I, I don't know, maybe these are maybe these are a pair of shoes where you have to fill out a form um, and kind of prove your allyship, uh, prove how much time you've donated to Black Lives Matter, prove how much time you've read reading black thought leaders and whatnot regarding i don't really know but regardless of that um regardless of those exercises you have to do in order to prove yourself worthy to wear the shoes i think as a shoe itself they're absolutely beautiful um i think the um, execution and um the final results is really well done i love the fact that they've got this whatever this effect is that most people do with sambas where they have this um what would you call it it's sort of like a back brushed suede nubuck effect here on the mud guard going around the eye lace stay. I think that really gives it a good little textural change and kind of switches it up, especially if you've got the, the upper basically one main colorway, which is kind of like a creamy, it looks like kind of off white color. And then of course, contrasting that with the leather is really nice too. Then you've got the contrast of, again with the stripes, this kind of crocodile faux print as well. I don't really like the laces too tough, I'll be honest. I'd like them either to be solid off white or the green, but again, not, not too shabby about that. And then I also love this little um, detail they've got on the back heel tab with the stitching going, is it kind of, what do you call that? Is that overlocking on the, um, on the hem here all around the back of the heel tab? I do like that. And of course the signature sort of gum saw on the outsole. Um, I do really, really enjoy those. So as an absolute, so as somebody again that doesn't wear samba too often or somebody that doesn't own many adidas in general i do think that colorway is really banging and then of course there's a red colorway which i'm not too fond of but i think people will definitely like them as well the same reason as well then there's another shoe model that i'm not really too familiar with this model that absolutely looks hideous but i'm sure they'll be for popular too with some group of people um but yeah I'm, i like them I like the collection overall. Um, one pair of shoes only, I'd probably pull for them, being the green with these white and green ones. But I think as an absolute execution of a shoe, I think they're not too shabby. I'm not going to lie. Um, it says here, the capsule incorporates influences from the seventies and eighties photography, music, in Boca and Fasto across apparel and footwear. The footwear element is um, collection features two silhouettes of Wells Bonner capturing the popular samba and introducing the country sneaker. Is that what it is? That's the country sneaker. Yeah, that definitely looks like a that definitely looks like a fresh home sneaker, and it? it looks like the one that you'd give your your cousin that just come fresh from yard to wear these. Isn't it? Jesus Christos, um, it continues. Uh, what one of the there have gone to two understated colorways. The second there, take a look, and the sneakers are yeah they're available now at the moment. So if you do want them, then definitely check them out. Um, I'm an actual big fan of these. I'm not going to lie. Jokes aside, I do think the white and green ones are definitely the best. But, but. Um, I'm just not a fan of the laces. That's the only thing I'm not a fan of. Just the laces kind of put me off. But regardless, not too shabby. Not too shabby. Next, in terms of collaborations and sneakers, we move on to Martin Rose. Just showed their, what, spring 2023 collection. And they debuted a pair of Nike shocks. And I'm surprised and, you know, somewhat shocked <laughs> that I actually like these. Normally, I wouldn't like these because I hate shocks. I think when I was growing up, shocks were mainly worn by filipino breakdancing guys who i've always said i've had a real bug to bear with those kids um you know there's plenty of times that they really fucking piss me off because they're always in the fucking hallway of sixth form fucking locking and popping themselves all over the place and being corny and lame um you know the, you know those kind of types of who are still wearing hundreds now and matching their sneakers with their hats and shit like just absolute dull lads. and they used to always wear shocks for some reason i don't know why shocks were popular with break dancers but they just were maybe because of the bounce maybe because they look so robotic and whatnot I don't know but i do like that martin rose clearly whenever she does collaborations with nike will take like a classic shoe and just twist it similar to what the um, similar to the kind of design principle that virgil has about three percent i feel like she does a lot of skewing does a lot of bending of proportions and whatnot and from what i can see of these nike shocks they look like a classic or 
normal Nike shock that you might be used to. But what she basically turned them into is a kind of a quasi wingtip shoe. It feels like like a kind of uncle shoe. So it's been somewhat elongated at the front. It's got this exaggerated toe box. It kind of looks a little bit more aggressive, a little bit more sharp in terms of this um, silhouette. Maybe the heel was a little bit higher as well. But it's just these tiny, tiny things that I've done that have completely changed the silhouette and the profile of the shock and made them look a little bit weird. Do you know what I'm if you get what I mean? Let me see if I can get up a normal shock. Nike shocks. And we'll see... Um, what what you mean by them let's let's see if we can do side by side so we can see if we can pick out what they actually look like differently okay not those ones so this is a classic one right this r4 so it's a shock r4 so the shock r4 so if you see them the classic ones which again these are the ones all the hit all the flipping breakdowns are just away and this black and silver and the silver and the silver and the old black and stuff right essentially they look like that also is that where's that clips over there right so let's move this over here so a classic shock looks like this so it feels like they have done some level of editing and changing in terms of the silhouette on the side so they are maybe a little bit slimmer in terms of their um profile towards the front because one of the weird things about shocks when you wore them you didn't really see the sh you know i guess the shock was like an uh an excuse for a bubble so you didn't really necessarily see them so it kind of made them look weird because the front was very really bulbous but the heel was very slim which is why i remember when i put them on actually i remember one of the things that kind of put me off in terms of wearing them myself but i do like the fact that they've kind of changed and updated it and made them look somewhat it feels like according to this picture of an original and that updated version it looks like it's been change slightly do you know what I mean maybe this is kind of a little bit more aggressive towards the back here in terms of being slanted and then you've got a little bit more of a point your toe at the front of course and it's really really exaggerated but I like them I feel they look absolutely nuts and crazy but I legitimately do like them they've basically turned shocks and made them into church shoes which is fucking incredible to see really but I do appreciate this because I think for the most part a lot of streetwear brands you know for for better or worse you know they get all the nike collaborations for the most part but i do feel like sometimes they do maybe take them for granted and just do too many colorway changes without actually challenging themselves and trying to update a retro model and trying to push the envelope a little bit and challenge their customers whereas martin rose does this on the often if you remember the classic what was it martin rose nike what were they called the monarchs that was a great um example of taking a classic shoe and sort of just twisting it to kind of fit the story that she was trying to tell right you got a classic monarch shoe here let's get it up on the other images right and then it's got all these weird bulbous little lumps on the outside right all over the place here to kind of just skew the proportions and what it looks like and the shape and everything like it looks crazy and it looks like it's been run run over by a car or put into a tumble dryer or something or maybe it looks kind of similar to what we used to do as kids when we used to stuff the tongue with socks to make them look a little bit more bulbous, a little bit more skate shoe type looking. But look how crazy they look there. They look really, really cool. So yeah, I'm eager to see what people do with these, with these. but I think these will be really popular, especially with the people that I tend to go out around, in and around of. You're definitely going to see these worn by a lot of people because I already see loads of people wearing them. Um, wearing the what those ones the nike shocks ones that you say the skepta ones right nike shop skeptas these ones i see people wearing these all the time so if these are really popular and they were able to kind of garner some crazy level of support i can only imagine what these are going to end up doing but even though these probably challenge people a little bit more but i do like them i think they look fucking great no idea on dates what they say here on the article any dates nope we don't have no idea stay tuned for release but yeah these are featured on a spring 2023 collaboration sorry the spring 2023 show um so definitely we'll keep an eye out for them and i'm assuming they'll probably end up coming up next year in it top of next year maybe spring so let's keep an eye out for those ones when they do drop da, 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 da. next on the list we have these news courtesy of hype beast concerning dr martin's tapping blondie mccoy to launch a updated adrian snaffle loafers now i don't mind the loafers i think they look pretty decent and pretty cool but if ever there was a shoot or an editorial that just screamed look at me look at me look at me it'd be this it's just a bit corny in it like from the fucking spirit away dog to the whatever outfit that is 
to the shoes themselves. It's just a little bit pretentious and a little bit up your own ass, isn't it? I'm not really too big fan of, like, you know what I mean? Who's, who sits at a cafe near the window eating a couple of croissants and some whatever those little things are and some bread, wearing a flipping leopard jumper, you know, in the middle of spring with some yellow loafers on if you don't want attention. Do you know what I mean? It's just a little bit pretentious, a little bit too much. But I do like the loafer itself. Um, um, I don't think it's something he designed. It looks like they maybe used him as a model to kind of prop them out there, which is a good idea. If you're going to go and kind of debut a model and make them uh, pop, maybe you're going to try and align them with somebody that you basically designed them in mind with. And it's essentially it looks like a classic, you know, what loafer they already have, Dr. Martin's in their arsenal, but they've updated it somewhat. You've got the front of the toe box looks a little bit more sleeker. Um, it kind of it's, it reminds me a little bit more of a, what are they what are the ones I've got the GHB Basun Wujin whatever loafers in terms of the overall silhouette with just the Dr Martin sole. So you've still got that um, chunky utilitarian whatever appeal with the outsole, but then you've got a very sleek upper. Maybe as well what they've maybe done is maybe updated the fit so they don't hurt your feet as much so if you are somebody who just wants to wear a casual pair of loafers and kind of freak yourself um, for the weekend and you know and impress all the honeys on Shoreditch High Street you can put these on without your feet bleeding you know what I mean or without you crying into an off license for some plasters so that might be a good result and absolute the, com the, the composition of this picture is pretty cool itself do you know what I mean with the with the old breakfast here that no one's clearly eaten as well going on there but it is a bit look at me it is a bit pretentious it is a bit cringe I'm not going to lie you know of course he's got a fucking England tattoo on his side Jesus Christ just absolute wild out of material in it proper wild out of material but I do like them I'm not going to lie I like the shoe um I hate the shoe I don't, I'm not, don't say I hate the shoe I dislike the shoe I think the shoe's a little bit up its own ass but I think if you do if you are trying to debut such a new model and get kids to get excited for them and you you've got a certain kid that you want in mind for them then maybe this is the case what's that a raw hemp dog dog lead as well like that's when you know you're real, real, really up there in terms of hipster, hipster pretentiousness, right? When you start carrying around your spirit away dog in a flipping um, raw hemp something, dog leads or something. I, I don't know. Is it hemp? Is it rope? I don't know what it is, but just buy a dog leash and it, it's not that difficult. But uh, <laughs> that aside, I like them. I think they look pretty sick, pretty decent. I'd absolutely wear the hell out of them. Will they bleed or will they make my feet bleed? Will I go home crippled? Probably. But let's see what they said in the article itself. Dr. Martin has given a look at this updated Adrian Snaffle Loafers, partnering with UK. Blah, blah, blah. The editorial shows a blondie on the streets of Paris, including eating his breakfast and walking a dog, all while, eat, all while wearing four new colours of the loafer, as well as sporting a gold Snaffle bar. The Adrian also features a kit. What's that? A kilt fringe with the same textile the color of the shoe itself the silhouette is part of dr martin's archive collaboration sorry archive collection and has been resurrected in a premium suede and construction with four colorways ranging from understated black to summer ready pops of color such as tan plum and turquoise so yeah more information coming soon of the agent silhouette is now the blunder uh the campaign at the event was that additionally the label will showcase the campaign at an event in Paris on June 24th okay so I guess during menswear Paris Men's Fashion Week they're going to be debuting it as well so there'll probably be some sort of event there DJs playing people band playing and shit but I'm guessing they're available now to buy or not let's see can you actually buy these now at the moment oh except oh let's see what they say here yes come on man continue let me just see the shoes can you shop them? Can you buy them? Or I have to just keep staring at this guy's mug eating sandwiches. Uh, snaffle loafers and suede. Let's see. Yeah, you can. You can actually purchase them. And they are £150, right? It seems like. You can't even stretch it that way. Is it 150 Yeah, 159 it looks like. 159 All sizes seem to be available at the moment. So they haven't been maybe as successful as they maybe have hoped. Um, the black colorway looks pretty decent, but if I'd have to go, maybe I'd go for the that turquoisey or that yellow colorway. It's probably the standout ones, isn't it? You're obviously not wearing them like that. That's fucking nuts. But okay, the the turquoise seems to be the the standout color everyone's buying because they've sold out in pretty decent sizes on those ones. Let's look at the yellows. Are the yellows doing any well? Yellows probably no one's really touched them for that regard. But yeah, 
I like them. I think they look pretty decent. Yeah, but definitely go for the turquoise or the yellow in terms of colours, in terms of sizes. But they look pretty sick. So check those out if you are inclined. If you are inclined. Um, what else are we going to talk about here? Harm. Let's see here. Let's move on from that one. Oh, this is a good one. Yeah, so this is an interesting one. So this is courtesy of Twitter. This is regarding, what's this guy's name again? Brendan Dune, one of the co-hosts of the sneaker podcast um, show thing on Complex I watch from time to time. He tweeted something very interesting over the weekend, which is as follows. It says here, Joe Hebert, the infamous reseller son of the former Nike vice president, popping back on Facebook to unload 400 pairs of Air Jordans. So the guy that was at the center of all that controversy with his parent, or I think his mum working at Nike and he's using his, the company car to purchase shoes and to obviously backdoor stuff and reselling, just basically exposing how corrupt and twisted and fucked up the sneaker business industry is. And also for me personally, giving um, me kind of the reason and the point as to why so many kids nowadays are basically going and buying replica sneakers and why the market is completely fucked up now because essentially the brands don't care and they allow people to basically get away with absolute murder in terms of backdooring shoes siphoning shoes off of stock amounts before they get to stores all these sorts of really crazy um, things that go on behind the scenes and it looks like even though all that stuff was a big deal and essentially his mum lost her job off the back of that whole controversy this kid is still has able is still able to kind of pull from his contact list or plugs wherever it may be in order to secure 400 pairs of air jordans and resell them on facebook which is absolutely heinous to say the least you know what i mean and i think in general this is why the market is rigged or well, that's why the game is rigged and this is why effectively i say if you're a fan of shoes and you're out there myself included i've you know i've been in this game for 20 plus years you know what i mean like no one can kind of doubt or question how long i've been in it and what i've done and whatnot and i'm not here to read off my credentials but it is what it is but i think personally i think as people individually what you should be doing is that you should be recognizing that the game is incredibly rigged i think nowadays as people clearly pointed out sneaker industry is a multi-billion dollar industry but for whatever reason you're still unable to buy the shoes that you want you see these hype limited edition releases you maybe see a really cool tier zero release with a cool box with some cool promotional materials behind it maybe a very exclusive colorway that's only for the tier zero kind of people a particular finish and you want them and you can't get them they only give them to flipping influencers and stuff. And if they are then released to the general public, they only produce a really small amount to select accounts. And those accounts are obviously going to, you know, um, cater towards their kind of local customers or people that they've kind of known for many years, which makes complete sense. So you're left in a bit of a shit situation where you're going to have to pay either above and beyond to get the shoe that you want, or you're going to have to try and enter yourself into the raffle system, which is already corrupt corrupt and completely nonsensical the fact that you have to pay money to enter a raffle to buy a sh to have a chance to buy the shoe with your own money it makes no sense it completely subverts um you know redefines what a raffle means the whole concept of a raffle is that you can get more for the price of the thing that you paid so you pay for a raffle of county fair and you can end up getting a teddy bear that's worth 30 dollars but you only paid the equivalent of one dollar for it the fact that you have to pay for the chance to purchase a shoe just goes beyond any form of reason but again this is where we're at and i feel like with that being where you're at with your chances of securing a shoe being basically based on you being lucky enough to be one of the people chosen by a computer's algorithm in order to kind of purchase a shoe you're in no you're in you're put in position or backed into a corner where you're going to have to either buy your shoes from gr spots or you're going to have to dip into the re, the replica market which is completely booming and i feel like really doing good and obviously a disservice to the general sneaker industry because what it's done is that it's muddied the waters especially what we've seen with StockX. we've seen people basically admitting on some twitter spaces that they've been running entire reselling operations off of buying replica sneakers off of these chinese websites and then selling them onto stock apps to um unsuspecting flipping buyers and having them be authenticated and whatnot and making absolute bucket loads of cash and it's been happening for a while if people are admitting it to it only now imagine what's happened during the peak of the pandemic and no one had any money so this has been going on for a while so the replica market has satisfied the demand but it's also i feel like 
complicated issues and made it worse because essentially there is no way to ascertain whether your shoe is legit or not unless you get it directly from the store or you get it from directly from the person associated with the brand there's no way of knowing aftermarket in the secondary market third market whatever it may be that that shoe is legit there's no way of knowing especially with the with the quick turnaround these replica factories seem to be able to turn shoes um that you know get leaked or whatever it may be and I feel like what well, part of the reason why is because the brands don't satisfy demand. The brands could easily increase the 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 amounts that they make with these limited edition shoes. At the moment now, sneaker culture isn't some underground thing. It's not something only the heads know about. It's not something only for the in the nose. It is a global phenomenon. Your mum, your dad, people that you would never believe beforehand know what reselling is they know about kids who are buying shoes for hundred dollars and flipping them online for one thousand everyone's heard of a yeezy so the mystery is completely gone so if that's the case just satisfy demand why are you trying to keep up this artificial scarcity thing when you know quite clearly that there is enough shoes to go around if you want to make them there's enough demand for them still if you want to do that like a good example being the reimagined chicago Jordan ones if they increase the quantities of those shoes and make 10,000 more 20 30 50,000 more they're still going to sell out you know what I mean the only thing that's going to affect is maybe the overall resale price but who gives a shit if you're a brand about resale price you should be focusing on the customers right but of course these brands obviously care about resale price because the resale price has a weird way I would imagine of somehow affecting and kind of bolstering their stock options on the, the way their stock looks and performance and obviously if you're somebody that's spearheading a project where you are in charge of maybe bringing in a set amount of collaborations and five out of the ten collaborations are reselling for ten times their value on online you're definitely going to include that in your deck when you're presenting to your superiors during your performance review so i completely get that but i feel like fundamentally this is a problem with the brands not a problem with the resellers not a problem with the factories nothing it's a problem with the brands themselves having worked for nike myself i know how kind of um murky and really weird it can get behind the scenes with people taking shoes allegedly off of you know store stock lists and stuff and ringing in favors and all this sort of dumb shit so by the time the shoes actually leave the stock rooms of nike or the factories whatever it may be and on their way to go to these individual accounts many many shoes have already been taken off of the of the pallets before they even get there do you know what i mean by people and let alone when they actually arrive at the store and you know the whole store is basically full of sneaker heads so you already have to discount for five people taking shoes off the pallet it's just a completely corrupt system but i feel like if nike were of the brands themselves nike i just whatever they maybe would come heavy or come down heavy and come down heavy on these people who are taking the piss out of their um access then this would stop but unfortunately we've had no repercussions for the likes of marcus jordan who it was alleged that he was selling um his shoes out of a hotel room beforehand to resellers right no consequences for him basically basically double dipping being paid a fee by nike to basically do the collaboration obviously whatever he's making at the store and then reselling them to resellers is absolutely heinous nothing happened to him his nike account has been taken away from him he's still getting limited edition drops at his store ridiculous and this kid who essentially cost his mom a job exposed a whole network of corruption at the highest levels of nike has still somehow got access to people within the you know important positions where it needed to be in order to secure 400 pairs of shoes it's absolutely crazy really really crazy and i feel like until the brands take it seriously and actually come down on these people and say hey enough is enough we're never going to see a change we really really are never going to see a change it's going to just keep continuing and continuing again and again and again and again and i think it's really 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 just disappointing back doors is actually still open i see like i said absolutely heinous um but yeah this is why i say if you're a sneakerhead out there and you're and you care about shoes and you just want to wear them don't doesn't matter where you get them from obviously try to enter sneakers obviously try to enter as many raffles as you can but if you're not unable to get them buy the reps fuck it these guys don't care about you they don't give a shit um they really don't they could care they could give they could give less of a shit um if you to secure the shoe or not through their means so if that's the case just buy them anyhow any way you can just keep going on because it doesn't look like they're trying to make any effort to stop all this finagle stuff that's happening in the scene anyway they're just letting it continue and it's absolutely horrible to see it really really is man especially as a long time fan the shoes are i just it once it breaks my heart but it's just annoying because especially for myself like 
now that I'm older and I don't have the patience I once did to kind of queue up and go to stores and whatnot, you know, I have more disposable income. I just want the shoes. I see something that I like, I want them. I know what date they're going to be released. I know who's collaborating on them. I know the information behind the people making them. I'm aware of the design influences. I'm a fan. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm, I've done all the necessary things. I've kind of jumped all over the hoops. Cool. I've proved myself to be cool enough to, to be deemed worthy to wear them. Now let me buy them. No, you can't buy them. Instead, I have to be inundated with images of Asa Bari wearing them in some terrible outfit for two seconds. Do <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Standing outside these expensive cars. It's like, bruv, like, why am I seeing images of influence? Like, nowadays, you see more influencers wearing limbs edition sneakers nowadays than you see regular punters. The only exception I could think of is maybe Sakai collaborations because it seems that they absolutely you know go ham in terms of the quantities that they put out there but most collaboration shoes you hardly see any regular people wearing you only see influencers that's sit day to day wearing them it's so so disappointing but what do i know next we move on to this news courtesy of hype beast figure featuring brain dead um, a brand that i'm obviously a big fan of especially kyle having worked with him previously on a few projects beforehand some of which you've probably seen on this channel before regarding mentoring of up-and-coming streetwear brands um but before that i was always a fan of the brand anyway and i kind of like what they did and then when i met him personally cool dude you know great vision um, the other guy he works with too, I forgot his name, but regardless, good team, they put out great product and over the years they've kind of gone from strength to strength and some of their best stuff, I think, stuff that gets overlooked is obviously their collaborations and they've got a collaboration coming up with Night, well, sorry, with Vans and it did answer a question that I've had for a while that I was kind of talking about on the podcast once regarding half caps and why more people aren't designing half caps, but look what Brain did are doing. They're actually putting out a half cab, a shoe that I feel like doesn't get the attention that it deserves from the van sort of um, lineup of shoes. I don't know why, maybe because it's not the most popular shoe nowadays with the kids coming up. So if you're collaborating, you want to sell shoes, you probably just go for the models that everyone loves and likes at the moment, which is old schools, skate, um, skate authentics and skate highs and stuff, but probably not half cab. But I think the half cab is definitely an overlooked end. I think somewhat um shoe that probably should get more hype but anyway this is the brand new collaboration with vans it features a slip-on i'm not sure what that model is on left a half cab and then an, an authentic which i'm definitely a fan of so yeah they've got here the model they've got a the half cab lx they've got an og lampkin lampin lx which i think is this shoe here and then they've got an og authentic lx and an og uh, slip-on lx i wonder what, what lx means lx means luxury is that luxury because of the materials or because of the padding? Because I know Authentics usually don't have any padding on them, but let's see. Uh, what else they have them on the next slide? More pictures. And I also love the fact that they do stuff like this, where they give people, where they feature in the editorial um, models that have been wear tested, quote unquote, by people associated with Brendan for a while as part of it. So you can see what they actually end up looking like when you bash them in every single day. They're fucking great. They look really, really good. I love the fact that they've got the different color eyelets on these. Lampins look fucking incredible. So it says here, it's da, da, da. Editorial notes that it's difficult to slip when bringing them brain dead on board of a project. The global network of artists and designers makes remixing classics. Products with all the graphics and references look like child's play. If a disruptive style is what you seek, then there's no better take on this than this task. Few brands can boast such an impressive lineup of graphic heavier prowess. Brain dead season to season, it doesn't miss whether you're knit kitting up your festival or needing a new street ready fits. This t shorts and shirts to make pairing for an occasion, especially throughout the summer. Um, of course, yeah, that lampin is really nice, isn't it? That model, really cool. The bold, bright palettes that call Brain Dead home have complimented. Uh, uh, um, bringing the beginning June, the pair reworked the OG cab and um, suede, and which sits atop of the inverted outsole. What does that mean, inverted outsole? What model is that? And equally as a colorway, heavy contrasting palette is the OG lampin model. Um, but, but okay, so supposedly the oh, inverted, maybe because it's black, I'm not too sure, but regardless, I love them all. More detailed look here, courtesy of the Vans website, showing some little details inside of the tongue. But yeah, look at that half cap. That half cap looks fucking good as fuck, man. That half cap looks fucking good as hell. The half cap maybe is maybe a standout model, I think, for all of them, for sure. But they still all look as great as ever. Yeah, I'm a big fan of them overall. What a great shoe. 
But yeah, Van's been doing some great stuff overall with the collaborations, you know, going back to the Eman Potato Head shoes store that dropped recently. Um, but yeah, big up um, Brain Dead shoes coming out on June 4th and uh, July 9th. Keep an eye out for them if you're that way inclined. Keep an eye out for them if you're that way inclined. Uh, what else we have to talk about here? So we've done that already. Get rid of this. Bish bash bosh. Well, so I think that might be it, you know. Yeah, I think that might be it for now. I don't want to waste too much more of your time. I'm going to end the show there for now at the moment. So this has been the Excellent Digger Show episode number 584. Thanks again for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company. If you have some check out the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash like, hit subscribe, leave a comment down below. If you listen to the podcast, I'll be here at tune. And if you watch it via YouTube, it will just end right here. But again, thanks again for checking me out. I'll see you guys soon. Take care. Peace.